an operating system that is an operating system. But Linux is a free and open source one that's out there a lot. Ability and experience in optimizing a Python 2 and 3 code for computational and I.O. efficiency. So this is where things start to get sort of interesting. So what they're saying here is we've got some stinky old code and we've got some new code. And we're interested in hiring a Python developer to come in and take a look at the code that we have and make it run faster. And it's for computational and I.O. efficiency. So I don't know what these guys are doing, but clearly they want the code to run faster. It's interesting, they could be actually in the financial markets, mm. right? You know, so I'd like to be able to crunch changes in stock values quicker so it could tell me to you know, buy or sell or do something like that quicker. So who knows what the story is? Uh, they want the person to have experience using web servers such as Apache or Tomcat, which just simply means this is all web-based stuff. They want to be able to access it and display the results on the web. And the last thing is familiarity with uh, XML. XML is a, a communication language that's used to link two different programs together, primarily on the web, but it's a human readable interface type of deal. You can sort of pick apart what's being exchanged if you take a look at it. So the interesting thing on this one is, so this is a legit software developer job. The thing that I want you to take away from this is Python is an important part of this, but just knowing Python by itself isn't quite enough. You can see that they want this person to know about databases, they want this person to know about another language, C++. You just have to have sort of like a passing understanding of C++. But they also want them to know about uh, an older version of Python and also some stuff about XML. So understand, software developers, you can't limit yourself to just a single language. There's sort of an ecosystem that you have to understand. But this is cool, because all this stuff is taught at the university. So after you get through all your classes, you'll have most of this knowledge. So. All right. So let's start off by talking about what a computer is. You basically know what a computer is. I mean, you see them, okay? You know, you have maybe a laptop. Everybody have a, have a cell phone? Is a cell phone a computer these days? It's pretty powerful, right? Yeah. So there's no question about that whatsoever. But if we say, what is a computer? Let's break it down to it, what it really is. Okay, so a, a computer consists of a CPU, basically a brain, right? CPUs take stuff in, they chew on them, process them, and kick results out the back, right? Memory is an electronic place where we store stuff. What happens to memory when you turn power off? Forgets everything, right? It's electronic memory. It's great. It's super fast, okay? When you turn power off on that computer, you've wiped out that memory, and it's gone, gone, gone. Which sucks if you're working hours on your program, and you just forgot everything. Which is why we have a hard drive, right? So you write stuff out to hard drive, you turn off uh, power on the computer, what happens to the information on hard drive? Stays on nothing, right? Little luck, at least don't fail, don't fail, don't fail. Everything stays on the hard drive, right? You can write to it, you can delete it off, you can change it a million times, there should be no problems with that. Now computers are great, but they do you no good if you didn't have any way to get information into it. So you got a keyboard for input, and you got a display or a printer or something like that for output. Poof, that's a computer, okay? You may see computers that are big, you may see computers that are small, you may see computers that are fast or slow, but they all have these basic parts to it. It's no more complicated than this. They may give them fancy names. I've got a Snapdragon processor. Yeah, whatever, okay? That's really just a CPU, okay? okay? So the gist of it is this is a computer in a nutshell. Now inside a computer, if you have one of those big old ones that sit on the desk and you top the top off, what you would discover is arguably one of the most important parts of the computer is called a bus. Okay? A bus is just like it sounds. It's basically it's a connector that connects all the different parts of the computer together. So I got my CPU here, I got my memory here, I got my hard drive here, I got my graphics adapter here, and maybe I've got my network card all the way over here, which is great, but if they're all little islands and they don't talk to each other, it's not going to do me any good. The bus is the thing that connects them all together. And it's actually, it's a line of circuitry that connects into each one of them. And the bus also generally delivers power to all those devices. Hey, they're all electronic devices. They're not going to work if they're on power, right? So if you pop the top off, uh, generally also uh, there's a motherboard. So a motherboard is a single printed circuit, pretty much in every computer, that holds all the important stuff on it. It has the CPU mounted on it. Maybe it has some memory mounted on it. some uh, special purpose chips mounted on it. And then all along the back of it, it has the bus. And everything plugs into the bus. And once you plug it into the bus, you can talk to everybody else in the computer. And that's how all the different parts of the computer are able to talk to each other. Now, central processing units are very interesting. They started in the early 1970s. 
Because you think, you know, so let's say America was founded and then the 1970s happened, right? Okay. So back in the 1970s, the clock rate for these things was 740 kilohertz. So let's talk about clock rates. So every CPU has a clock. And a clock does exactly what every clock in the world does. Tick, 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 tick. Nothing more fancy than that. But what's interesting from a computer point of view is every time it ticks, the computer can do one instruction. Okay? So the faster that clock ticks, tick, 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 the more instructions that computer can get done in the same amount of time. That make sense? Gotcha. So back in the day, the very first CPUs that showed up, they were doing 740,000 instructions per second. It's a good way to think about that, right? It's kilohertz, and hertz is cycles per second, so 1,000 cycles per second. That's pretty cool. By the time we hit 1978, so just seven years later, the Intel 8086 came out. 8086 is interesting because it was the very first chip CPU that was used in the very first IBM home computers, so it's sort of a big deal. But notice that it was doing 10 megahertz. Megahertz is what? Mega is mil, mil, million, right? So 10 million instructions per second. So we went from 740,000 up to 10 million instructions per second, which is pretty impressive. Then we got up to 1993, and the Intel Pentium chip was doing 66 million instructions per second. And today, if you went out and bought something, you'd probably buy an Intel Core i7, which does 4 gigahertz. Gigahertz is like 1,024 megahertz. But basically, it's flying. This thing is just absolutely flying. And you can see how we've done over time. Now, by the way, is 4, giga, 4 giga, gigahertz it? Is that as fast as where we're going to go? Oh, no. Okay. You know, five years from now, we'll look back at this and go, really? You live for that? That's incredible, right? So let's see, central processing is the brain, coordinates the uh, actions of all the other components. So yeah, the CPU is in charge of the computer. And the way you build a CPU is you build it on silicon, which is just a particular material that they use. Basically, in the world of electrical engineering, there's something called a transistor. A transistor is simply sort of a switch, on, off, on, off. And they put literally millions or even billions of those today's CPU. So it's really, really quite impressive how they do this stuff. This is if we pop the top off of a CPU. This is what you would see inside. This particular one here is the IBM cell processor. Anybody have a PS4, PS3? The cell processor is what they actually use in that one. It's a really fantastic chip. Very, very fast. Uh, so we talked about uh, clock, we talked about hertz, uh, megahertz is what we're up to. Um, what's interesting is the little brain inside of the CPU, which is the part that does the processing, is called the core. Basically, the one that processes instructions. Some bright engineer, someplace said, said, you know, we're making these things smaller and smaller. You know, we could probably fit more than one core into a CPU, which means that a single CPU could operate, could execute two instructions on the same clock cycle. Tick, two instructions. Tick, two instructions. Click. So what's happening is they're starting to add more cores. So they're creating well tech core CPUs. Four, core, core, core. That's a four core CPU, which means you can do four things at exactly the same time. I have a two core CPU on my system at home. What's interesting is when I'm doing like um, video conversions, converting from one video format to another format, and doing a bunch of files, it can do two video files at exactly the same time. Okay? The reason it can do that is because it's got two cores. Converting videos is just a math function, right? From this format to this format. So it's able to do them at exactly the same time. It's sort of a cool thing to do. If I had a four core or a five core, I'm pretty sure it could probably do five videos at exactly the same time. So multi-core CPUs are probably the way for the future. It just means that the computer will be able to do multiple things at the same time. So how is information stored in a computer? So how do we get all this stuff? All these computer programs that we write, all these Xbox games, all the uh, apps that you download on your uh, phones, how do we actually get them uh, into the computer? The answer is really almost sort of disturbingly simple. Everything that the computer does is based on zeros and ones. And I'm sure you guys have probably heard that before. But it's really, it's a binary system. So both data and programs are obviously stored in the computer. And by the way, from a computer's point of view, both data and programs look exactly the same. The computer can't tell the difference between what's data and what's a program, because it looks exactly the same thing. You have to tell it. Uh, computers are arguably nothing more than a set of switches. That's a switch. 
which has two positions. What are the two positions? First, a light switch in your house, the one, and turn the lights off when you leave. Right? You ever hear that? That's it. That's it. These zeros and ones are interpreted as digits in the binary number system and are called bits. So that's one bit there. It's either zero or one. It's no more complicated than that. If you can understand that light switch, if you can understand the zero and one, you've got the binary system mastered. No more complicated than that. And that's the world of computers. Now the question is, why? Why do they go to the Why can't they use numbers like we use? So we use what's called a base 10 system. What digits do we have to work with? No. Well, so the answer was 1 through 9. The answer is no. That's not quite right. What is it? Zero. There you go. Exactly. 0 through 9. So if I tell you any number, 1,473,000. And if I asked you to write that down, you'd use you know, one, this is one million, and then a seven, and a three, you know, right, okay? So you, got, you know how to do that, right? That's cool. In the world of binary, you don't have those ten digits. You only have two digits. What digits do you have? Zero and one. Zero and one. So you have to write every single number using just what? Zero and one. That's it. That's all you have to work with. So, if I'm going to write the number zero, guess what I use? Yay, zero. If I use to write the number one, guess what? One. So we're good so far. When I bump into two is when it gets a little bit weird. It's one zero. Why is that? Well, I'll show you in just a moment. Right? And so it goes down the list. But binary numbers are the exact same number you've always known. It's just we're writing it differently, only using two characters. Zero and one to represent the number. So let's take a closer look at this. It's binary math time! Woohoo! You ready for this? Let's take a look and see what we got up here. So I've got a bunch of columns. Okay? Two raised to the zero power is what? Two raised to the one power is two. Four. And it's not there, but if there's one more there, what would it be? 1024. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we've got these positions. Now remember, in our base 10 number system, we've got positions too, right? There's the 1's position, and then the 10's position, and then the 100's, and then the All right. So you know, you're already used to this sort of stuff, right? So we have positions here, right? So this is good. Okay. So the first number I want to do is 1. So how do you think I should represent 1 in binary? 1. Let's put a 1 there. Cool. Anyway, do you have to do anything else, or is that it? Okay. Next number is 23. How do I represent 23 in binary? Sorry, 16. Well, that's an interesting question. Okay. So, is 23 greater than 1? Yes. Yeah. Is 23 greater than 2? Yes. 23 greater than 4? Yes. 23 greater than 8? Yes. 23 greater than 16? Yes. 23 greater than 32? Yes. Okay. So, 16. Okay, so 16 plus 8, is it greater than 23? Yeah. Okay, so I can't use that, can I? Nope. Uh, 16 plus 4, is it greater than 23? Nope. Okay, so I can use that one. So 16 plus 4 gets me up to what, like 20? Mm -hmm. If I add 2 to that, am I going to be greater than 23? Nope. No. So I can use that. And I need what, one more? Yep. <laughs> All right, so 23 in binary is what? One, zero, one, one. That's it. Congratulations, you've done it. Pat yourself on the back now. Wait, now let's do 65. Okay, 65 greater than 1? Yep. Greater than 2? Greater than 4? Greater than 8? Greater than 16? Greater than 32? Greater than 64? Greater than 128? So we back it up. Okay, so 65 plus 32, is that going to be greater? Oh, I'm sorry, 64 plus 32, is it going to be greater than 65? Okay. So we're going to have to go all the way back there, right? So 64 plus 1 is what? 65. Cool. So we just fill in the rest of zero, right? So 65 in binary is? 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. There you go. Why don't we use binary for everything I say? <laughs> okay, 128 in binary. Okay, so 128 greater than 1? 128 greater than 128? And what do we put here? Zero, zero. 1,003. Okay, so is 1,000 great and 3 greater than 1? Yep. Is 1,003 greater than 512? Yep. Now, the next number is 1024. Is 1,003 greater than 1024? Yep. So we should go on there, right? 
So then uh, we have 2 plus what? Uh, 256. Uh, maybe 128. Add that in. 64. 32. Skip a couple. Stick in a couple zeros. Poof. Make sense? And if we took all of these and put one in all of these positions, what would the number be? 10 by 3. 10 by 3. And so the next one is 1024, right? Which is actually 2 to the 10. So binaries with computer speaks is not that hard to convert between decimal and binary. And by the way, you can do the flip side, right? So if we wanted to convert this number into decimal, what would we do? We'd say this is 1 plus 2 plus 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 oh, and that would be 23, right? So we can easily move back and forth between those two numbers. Okay. Computer speak binary, we speak base 10. Gotcha. Bits are a pain in the butt to keep track of, okay? Because there's so many of them, they're sprinkled all over the place, but don't worry about that. So what we do is we collect them together. We collect eight bits together. We say, great, we're going to call that a byte. A byte is simply 8 bits. Okay? Right here, got 8 bits, 1 byte. So I want to represent 23 as a byte. Remember, 23 was 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. I had three zeros at the beginning. Bam! 8 bits makes a byte. That's 23. Now, if I have a number that's too big to fit into a single byte, not a problem. I just create two bytes. I can shove it in there. That make sense? So generally we talk about bytes, we don't talk about bits, because bits are just too big small. Okay, um, so now we have the problem of what I like to call the capital A problem. So if you're using Microsoft Word and you're writing a letter home to your mom, which mom really appreciates every time you do that and stuff like that, and you type a letter A, a capital letter A, do you think the little brain inside the computer, the little CPU, knows what a capital A is? It speaks binary, right? So if you give it a capital A, it's going to, it's going to throw up. I don't know. Capital A, right? So it sounds like you're going to have to encode it, right? You're going to have to reach, you are going to have to reach an agreement with that microprocessor and say, listen, I know I can't give you a capital A. How about if I give you a number? And every time I give you that number in the right context, you'll go, oh, you mean capital A. That's not like a fair deal? Come up with a secret code. And there is that secret code it's called ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or some god awful thing like that. ASCII's been around forever, okay? And the reason it's been around forever is because it works. It's a really, really effective way to do things. So effectively, what an ASCII table is is it's simply an encoding for all the characters that you're going to find on a keyboard, okay? So let's take a look at our buddy, Mr. Capital A. So the decimal value under the ASCII encoding system for a capital A is 65. So if you wanted to give an A to a computer, to a CPU, instead of giving it a, an A, you'd give it a 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And the CPU would be saying, thank you. Oh, you mean capital A. I appreciate that. And then if it sent it to some sort of display system, and you're a display system and you got 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, what would you stick on the screen? Capital A, right? Because you're smart. You know how the ASCII table works out. So you can see that capital A is encoded different than capital than lowercase a. Lowercase a is a 97. Okay? And this column here has a whole bunch of really funky, weird stuff. But you gotta remember this has existed for a long time. These are sort of how you encode um, how you determine the uh, end of line, end of line, end of transition, end of text, end of text. So if you were reading stuff in from a file and you encountered the end of text character, you know you were at the end of the line, right? One of the really cool ones that I personally like is the bell character. If you send the bell character to the screen, your computer will go bing. Not that big of a deal, but it's always put handy back in the day. So ASCII is how we encode the language that we speak in a way that the computer can understand. Every character has an ASCII value. The ASCII value is what the computer actually processes. Does that make sense? Got it. Storage. Can you ever have enough storage? No. You, your cell phones, you take all the selfies, and it just keeps going. So you guys have cell phones, right? How much storage you got on your cell phone? So you got eight? Eight gig? What? 120. Wow, that's a big one, man. Anyone, anyone got more than that? 
64 is actually pretty huge, right? 16 is sort of standard, I think, right? Yeah. No, cloud storage, you get it, that's cheaper. Right now. That's right. now, with all that fantastic memory you have on your cell phone, is it enough? No. That's not even close, right? Man, if I had more, I could download this, I would have to keep cleaning it off, right? Throwing away all that stuff? Okay, so how does this actually work? Well, the concept of this is we want to have a vocabulary so we can talk about storage. Okay, pretty simple stuff. So remember, we're talking about bytes. A kilobyte is about a, about a thousand bytes. The reason we say about is it's really 1,024 bytes. But what the heck, we'll say it's a thousand bytes. A megabyte is a million bytes. A gigabyte is a billion bytes. And a terabyte is about one trillion bytes. Trillion bytes, man. There's no way we could ever possibly need that, right? Oops. Guess what? So you go out to any uh, computer supply store today, and you can buy terabyte drives. How big of a terabyte drive can you buy? Uh, two, or four. two terabytes was popular a little while ago. How big is it now? I think it's four. It's six. I think it's six. And the guys who make hard drive storage are just crazy. I think it's all Russian scientists, so I'm not really quite sure. <laughs> but there's a company that makes one that they seal the hard drive in helium so that they can spin it really fast and they can read and write very, very quickly and stuff like that. So they're, they're, they're doing crazy stuff. But, well, yeah, solid state pretty good, but it's really expensive. And also, it doesn't last forever. It does wear out. So, yeah, there's like some extraordinarily cool stuff going on. By the way, the storage just gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time, which is good because you guys just don't really need anything. We all use it. Um, this is our interesting one page of Word document. It takes up about 20K, 20,000 characters. That's you know, pretty standard sort of stuff like that. One meg can store up to 50 pages of documents, and a gig can store up to 50,000 pages of documents. They say a typical two hour high res movie might take eight gigs. Uh, that's a little hard. I know that a movie, a digital movie, takes about 700 to 800 meg traditionally. I think if you get high definition, you're probably looking at about 1.5 gig. I think there's some compression and stuff going on with that. View. There's something called, you guys know what 4K yeah. televisions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 4K televisions are interesting as a concept. But man, I have absolutely no idea what kind of storage you're talking about. For something that has that kind of resolution, they're going to need to have some serious storage. I mean, high definition stuff, I mean, it obviously takes up like a DVD, right, which is about 4 gig. I would only think the uh, streaming would, or, uh, the only solution for uh, 4K is going kind to of be streaming. We don't actually store it on anything. All right, memories. So remember, that little CPU is sitting there, having a good day, everything's fine. If you actually want it to do something, you need to put your program in the memory, and then you have to tell the CPU that it's there, and say, listen, I've put some code into your memory. Go process it. Go take action. Well, how does this work? Well, so every memory location has an address. 2000, 2001, 2002. Just like in your neighborhood, every house or every apartment has an address, right? And if I came to your address and I knocked on the door, you would be there, right? Okay, same thing with a memory location in a computer. If I come to an address and if I knock on the door, there is a value stored at that address. That value may change over time. You move out of your apartment, somebody else moves in, that's fine, you've got the problem with whatever. But every address contains a value. So when the CPU goes looking at an address, it pulls a value out of that. It might be a value for a number of students in the class, and it adds another one to it because somebody added the class, and then it stores that value back in the memory. Uh, you can address all the bytes in the memory can be accessed in any order because it's random access memory, current contents of the memory byte is lost. Whatever. So basically, if you have something stored at a memory location, everything's good, everything's every good. You can store another value on top of that. When you store another value on top of that particular value, the old value is gone forever. That makes sense? No more complicated than that. Storage devices, you guys know all about storage devices. We've got hard drives, we've got obviously DVDs, we've got obviously flash drives and stuff like that. Uh, it's a non-volatile store. Uh, actually, computer's memory, RAM, is volatile storage memory. If you kill power to your laptop, what happens? You forget everything, right? Now, there is something called flash memory. Flash memory is used in your cell phones, right? So you can reset your cell phone, but pretty much if the thing goes off, it doesn't do that. It remembers what's going on. 
program to data. We got magnetic disks, optical disks, and USB flash drives. Input output computers are of no use to us if we can't tell it what to do. So we got our input devices so the keyboard and the mouse. Output can be a display, can be a printer, can be whatever you want it to do. Lots of computers these days actually don't have any output because they just talk to other computers. Uh, networks, man, we could have a whole course on networking. I suspect the university probably does or soon will have a course on networking, right? A zillion different types of networks, LAN, LAN, LAN. You guys know all about Wi Fi, right? Alright. So what's software? So we talked a little bit about the hardware. We talked about the bus and the CPU and all that. So that's great. That's fantastic. And I don't really care about that. Let's talk about software. So on the hard drive, you store your program. You can read that, right? I mean, that seems to make sort of sense. You load your program into the memory. Fantastic. That's wonderful. You can still read it. And then you submit your program to the CPU. Can you read it now? No. Does the CPU speak the same language that you do? Does it understand your program that you wrote in the beautiful Python language? Absolutely not. It doesn't have a clue as to what you're saying. Because it can't. That CPU only speaks binary. Only give it zeros and ones. That's the only thing you can possibly understand. Okay. Computer languages. Is there just one computer language? There's new computer languages literally every day. Okay. Uh, we've got what, basic, we've got visual basic, we've got MySQL, well, MySQL is really data is more than anything else. We've got Ruby on Rails, uh, C, MATLAB, I guess you want to call it Latin. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that. So, yeah, there's a zillion different languages. And the reason that there's a zillion different languages is because each language does some particular task really well. So, for the people who are doing that task, there's a language which is probably the best language for them to use. Huh? Computer programs on the software are instructions to tell the computer what to do. So those computers, they're lovely, they're fabulous, but computers are dumb. Left to their own, the computer does nothing. It just sits there quietly. Okay? You actually have to tell it what to do. All right, so let's talk about where all this computer language stuff starts. It starts at something called machine language. Machine language is as close as you possibly can get to the actual hardware itself. This is the way it works. So let's say, so this is the control unit. This is that cute little CPU chip that we talked about. CPU chip has something called registers. Registers are simply places where the CPU can store a value. It's very simple stuff. I can stick a value in a register. And I probably have about five registers. So I've got five places I can stick values. I'm going to have a little bit of additional logic that's going to allow me to fetch instructions and then addresses and stuff like that. But if I start out with the value of seven being stored in one of my registers, how the world starts. And then I pass to the CPU the magic code 40. The CPU is programmed to understand that 40 means increment the AX register. Well, my AX register has what in it? So if I'm going to increment it, it's going to turn into eight. There you go. So this is the lowest level of programming you can have. When you pass a 40 to a CPU chip and it increments a register, because that's what the magic number 40 tells it to do. The next magic number you're going to pass it is 5, and it's going to be followed by another value of 5. What that's going to do is it's going to say, add 5 to the AX register. Well, if AX had 8 in it, and you added 5 to it, it turned into what? 13. Okay. Machine language is down in the dirt. It's as close as you possibly can get to the middle. And when they first invented computers back in the day, this is what they programmed it. So people would sit around and they'd write 40, so they'd write 5 followed by another 5. So they'd write out all these numbers, which was effectively a computer program. Does that sound like it would be fun to do? How hard would that be to find if you did something wrong? Pain the way. Some question about that was done. So you know, they did this for a little while. They said, gosh, there's got to be a better way. It turns out there is a better way. It's called assembly language. Now, if this is machine language, this is assembly language. Assembly language sits right on top of machine language. It's not that far from machine language, but it does make life a lot easier. So let's take a look at this. So this is move the value storage of the location data into the AX register. Well, we were just doing stuff with AX, weren't we? Move the value of the AX register into DS, jump to the location exit, move the value of 04C into the register AH, move whatever stored at X code into A1, Number 21H. You know, does that almost seem like it's readable? Does that seem a little bit better?
better than 40 followed by 5, followed by another 5. Okay. Assembly language is actually doable. When I first joined Boeing, when I was working on the F-18 fighter jet, we did all of our programming in assembly language. Right? There's some reasons for that. We wanted to be very close to the hardware. And on a fighter jet, if the pilot hits the big red button, things need to happen right then. It can't be like, well, hey, I'm busy. I'll get around to launching the missile in just a, like a couple of minutes here. It has to happen right then, so we did it in assembly language, because it gave us complete control over the hardware on their aircraft, okay? So this was a huge improvement in the world of programming. This is actually maintainable, okay? It's still ugly. You're still really, really close to the chip. Okay? You've got a lot of power, because you've got all access to the chip, but it's going to take you a long time to develop your code, because you're having to worry about everything. Now, the computer can't understand assembly language. Okay? If you wrote this in a language you can sort of understand, the computer can't understand it. So you write your assembly code, you run it through something called an assembler, which is another software program. And that software program produces what's called a machine code file, zeros and ones. So this produces something that looks like this, the 40 and 5. Um, so it turns your code into this. OK, so that's pretty handy. Okay? So, and then you go ahead and run it. So this is actually cool. This is pretty cool. Right? This made life a lot better. So people, software developers became a lot more productive when they had this. We're not going to use any of those. We're going to use something that's called high-level language. So Python is a high-level language. Guess what? There's a whole bunch of other high-level languages, and each one of them has been designed for a very specific purpose. Okay? Python's actually a great place to start. It's pretty forgiving in a lot of different ways. It's a very good interpreter and stuff like that. So we're going to operate up at this level. But can the computer understand your Python program? If I gave your Python program to a CPU, what's it going to do? It's going to throw up all over you, right? So I have no clue what that is. Okay? So here's what has to happen. One of two things. First off, you take your fabulous Python program, and you're going to need an interpreter. And that interpreter takes your language in real time, changes it into zeros and ones, and passes it to the CPU. Alternatively, you're going to have your high-level Python language. You're going to compile it into machine language code. And then any time you want, you can take that machine language code, pass it to the CPU, and the program will actually run. Okay? But notice, your Python program never gets given to the CPU. It always passes through one or more other programs. So they can be translated from your beautiful, wonderful Python instructions into what? One, two, zeros, zeros, and ones. So ultimately, that's all the CPU can ever all right, everything depends on the operating system. We understand how that one works. What did we cover today? Learned what a computer was. Discovered how CPUs have evolved over time. Went over the binary numbering system. Reviewed different types of computer storage. And studied the different levels of computer programming. Machine, assembly, and higher level. Next time, software and programming. That's it. If you didn't sign my sign up sheet, sign up before you leave. Otherwise, I will see you on Monday.